Hello and welcome to episode 48 of the AABIP Podcasts. This is your host, Udit Chara, and I am honored to be in the presence of Yaron Gersthalter from UCSF. Yaron, thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you very much, Udit. The, the, the honor is all mine. And with Yaron today, we are going to be talking about large versus small board chest tubes. And I would clarify that any um, opinions expressed on this podcast by Yaron or me are strictly ours and not necessarily those endorsed by the AABIP. So, Yaron, before we get started, do you have any relevant conflicts of interest that you would like to disclose? None relevant to this topic. Perfect. Okay, so let's get started with large versus small bore chest tubes. So, Yaron, what do you define as a large bore chest tube? So, I know that there's a lot of uh, back and forth in the literature about how to define by the French gauge or French or caliber of the catheter as to what's large and what's small bore catheter, but for me, it just really depends on what you're trying to achieve and getting away with the smallest size as possible. I don't have a strict cutoff. I tend to think of sort of 14 French as being the largest small bore that I would use. But I don't know that 16 French versus 14 French really is a significant or clinically significant difference. Um, anything that has to be surgically placed that's going to be more dis- uh, uncomfortable for the patient, I start to think of more as a large bore uh, chest tube. So in your bronchoscopy suite or procedure suite, um, what French do you go up to with your chest tube collection? Do you have a 40 French? Uh, we might have one in the OR, but it's not something that we use um, routinely. Workhorse that we have is going to be the the 14 French. It's very easy to place, especially you know when we have fellows around there, it's good for them to learn how to place because it's all Seldinger. And I think that, um, by the way, the, the technical piece of how you place the catheter also weighs in into the um, level of discomfort that we're going to sort of afflict on our patient with the uh, chest tube placement. The other catheter that we use a fair amount is the 8 French, just a pericardial drain. Um, in pleuroscopy, we'll place sometimes larger ones, 20 Frenches, um, but those are sort of surgical ones and those are Those are already where I start to say, oh, this is a larger bore, though I don't know necessarily that they're needed, but um, really the main um, chest tubes that we have around are the 8 and the 14. Those are really the workhorses. So you mentioned about larger bores being more uncomfortable for the patients. So when you're placing a large bore chest tube in someone who is not sedated, uh, do you have any preference in positioning the patient, any medications you give for pain control? So usually when I'm placing like a surgical pigtail, it'll be in the in the context of a pleuroscopic uh, uh, procedure. In those cases, they're always in the decubitus position. They're always getting some sort of moderate, um, and anest- uh, moderate anesthesia care. And I've actually started to also employ more ESPDs in the urgent. Uh, situation where you know you're at the bedside and you're not in the operating room setting and I need to place a pigtail I'll always place a Seldinger very infrequently I can maybe count on two fingers the times that I had to place a bedside surgical chest tube and and in those contexts I I'm usually fine with just um, lidocaine and then uh, so so you seem to prefer small bore chest tubes uh, in all if not the majority of circumstances. One of the downsides of small bore chest tubes is that they tend to get clogged. So what is your flushing regimen that you follow for these? Yeah, so that's an excellent point, you know, and um, it it sort of rings true now. We actually have a patient in the hospital who has an eight French for a pneumothorax, which was doing really, really well when it was not kinked. And one of the issues was really sort of kinking and, the patient would re-expand their pneumothorax every time, um, you know, the, the chest tube went un, sort of watched. So w- with chest tubes, you have to examine the chest tube daily. And when I say examine the chest tube, you have to go from skin to box. Really examine it very well. Make sure that nothing is kinked. Um, if, if only I had a nickel for every time, you know, there was some issue with the tube and then sort of you could figure it out. Um, just by sort of the bedside exam. In terms of flushing, ideally, we would have the tube flushed twice a day. The problem is that you also want to be careful not to tax the team too much. Assuming everything is 
straightforward. I usually make the recommendation of just once a day bedside on rounds. If the if there's more of an issue with with the tube, say you know lots of clots, let's say there's blood or you know infectious debris or something like that, then you'll you'll probably need to talk to the team about flushing it more often or flush it yourself more often. But those are probably the situations where you actually want to go on the larger end of 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 the chest tube size and um, and those are the ones that I'm going to probably go for the 14 Frenches. Um, I will say, you know, anecdotally, um, there is, you know, small data, even in hemothorax, which is sort of what we historically think of as the most, you know, um, chest tube clogging of, of diagnoses that even, you know, in the acute fresh setting, you can even manage them with like central lines that are eight French. There's, you know, um, I once gave a presentation and I presented some data out of China from that. Um, not to say that we should be managing hemothoraces with eight French, but I think it does suggest that if, if you take good care of the chest tube, the size of the t- tube doesn't necessarily confer for the clinical benefit. So at least one theoretical benefit of large bore tubes is that they are less prone to clogging yeah. uh, because of their size. And based on what you're saying, it really begs the question that is there any indication left uh, for large bore chest tubes? And and let's sort of look at this on a scenario basis. So you did mention hemothorax. So if you see a patient with a hemothorax, either in the emergency room or post-procedure complication, you are placing a small bore chest tube? I'll probably place like a 14 French because I also think that it's it's a little easier to get done sooner and you can always sort of increase it if it's not working in the acute setting. And this is actually something I've encountered where, you know, I've spoken to the thoracic surgeon and we're like, what do we do now? And um, sort of in, in a pinch, the 14 French um, sort of was helpful. I'll tell you where I do tend to place um, sort of the surgical tube more often is if I'm doing, for instance, pleurodesis in a patient who I suspect I might need to follow up with with a blood patch, those are ones that I'll probably also place a surgical chest tube aimed apically because the the blood patch might, you know, clog up. And again, I'm not placing a 40 French. I'm probably going to place something like a 20 French. You know, I'm trying to also minimize discomfort to the patient. And, you know, even though 20 French isn't comfortable no matter what. I do think that there's also... Um, benefit to smaller tubes going into the gutters because I think that they suction better. Um, it's just harder sometimes unless you have like an angled surgical tube. I find that the smaller tubes are just easier to get into the gutters. And Does that answer your question? Does that yeah, no, it does. It does. It's slightly different to what I do. Uh, you know, uh, I, mm-hmm. I'm totally a believer in that, you know, if it's blood and it's still fluid, the small mm-hmm. bore tube will drain the blood. And if there is clot, it doesn't matter if you put a 50 French chest tube, it's not going to come out. Yeah. So so I, I'm always game for the small bore tubes with hemothoraces. My concern is twofold. One is with the data is that, of course, there, we know there are two RCTs. Uh, both of them have limitations. One did not meet enrollment. Both of them excluded patients and extremists who could not be yeah. consented. But my biggest concern is that, yes, you place a smaller tube and then you're draining the hemothorax immediately. But if there's, if the blood is you know, coming, then I feel that if you don't have a good regimen to flush it and someone doesn't stay on top of it all the time, uh, the smaller tube will likely clog much faster. So I still haven't completely changed uh, my practice to going to Seldinger 14 French tubes for hemothoraces, but I guess in every other circumstance I have. <laughs> and let's touch upon those. Yeah. So, and, uh, and you're right, you know, he, hemothorax is, uh, thankfully, it's it's the outlier, but th- those are the sticky ones. It's it's those and the sort of really thick uh, empyemas that are sort of always going to be the head scratchers as to sort of um, what size uh, can get away with on the smaller size. So you mentioned empyema. In what circumstance, so we all know that smaller tubes are enough and uh, good enough in empyema. So in what circumstance do you consider a larger tube? For empyema, I'll almost universally place like a 14 French, is the honest truth. Um, I think that if it if you can't really get out the, the sort of um, thick debris and if you don't feel like you'll be able to get good source control, um, with uh, a smaller bore. And again, I'm calling 14 French here smaller bore. 
um, with TPA or some sort of uh, lytic regimen, TPA DNAs, then those are probably the cases that the surgeon is going to need to intervene. Um, you know, I, I do wonder about fluoroscopy with um, empyema. I know, you know, there's um, not great literature, but maybe some is starting to emerge. And in which case you can maybe make the you know case that if you're already going to place a surgical tube, then why not stick a camera and wash it out? I think that's going to be one of the next questions for empyema uh, beyond sort of MIS-3 and MIS-4, which I think is sort of under, under um, construction now. But um, I think that if you're already contemplating like placing a large surgical chest tube for empyema or for hemothorax, that's probably when you're going to start the interdisciplinary discussion with the thoracic surgeon or with IR for hemothorax. And this is um, where I also have changed my practice. Initially, I would, um, you know, if I got thick, uh, more viscous fluid out, I, I would tend to put a larger bore chest to you. But then even in those circumstances, I ended up, you know, having to use TPA DNAs. So really, I don't think it's the size of the chest tube that matters. I think if you're getting um, more viscous stuff out, it just probably implies that they are more likely to need some yeah. sort of intervention, either uh, intrapleural enzymes or VATs. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm almost universally now a small board yeah. chest tube placer for empyema. And again, those are the ones that I wouldn't place like an eight French. Absolutely, you know, yeah. 14 French all the time, yeah. The eight French is, is good for like a really simple but really large effusion or, you know, pneumothorax in a pinch kind of thing. Um, but really the, the workhorse is, is a 14 French. So what size chest tube are you placing for pneumothoraces then? So... Again, I, I love the 14 French. It's, it's, you know, it's, um, it's really become sort of the workhorse for me. Um, I, I do play sometimes eight Frenches if, if I'm worried more about, you know, frailty and sort of what the pain will do. And I have a little bit of time to think about it. Um, just the, the eight French can be, um, much easier on the patient. Um, so, you know, if I have a little bit of time and if I think that, you know, if this is going to be like, if it's an iatrogenic pneumothorax where I think there's a small defect that will probably heal up pretty nicely, then I'll probably, you know, put my hand on an eight French. But if this is someone who, you know, very severe underlying emphysema with a lot of bullous disease and I'm, you know, and I'm worried that this is going to be a while, then I'll probably do the 14 French. So, just to take out the dis uh, from the discussion later on is to upsize. We're not sort of keeping up with the defect kind of thing. So let me give you a circumstance where you put an eight French in, in somebody, let's say, who has a secondary spontaneous pneumothorax or an iatrogenic pneumothorax, and then if you're just not able to bring the lung up, there's still a moderate-sized pneumothorax, you're considering a second chest tube. Is your second chest tube also an eight French, or is it something larger? No, that, that's usually when, you know, when, if, if we're really trying to achieve apposition, then we're going to probably, uh, I'll, I'll reach for something larger, not an eight French. Then I'll probably do, you know, the 14 French and upsize kind of thing. What if you have a uh, subcute emphysema? Again, I, I think you could still achieve, you know, um, a good, I think sort of the, the first go-to would be um, the 14 French, if it's really diffuse and, and whatnot, then, uh, we could talk about it. Thankfully, I haven't had to run into that situation so much, but, um, if it's really diffuse and I'm worried about sort of airway crepitus with change in voice, then, you know, we could talk about, um, doing, uh, a surgical one. Um, uh, but if, if the mechanism is very clear to me and the patient is stable and it's just like local, then, you know, local sub Q emphysema that's, you know, spreading slowly, then uh, 14 French is probably still going to be my go to. It also depends a little bit on the size of the pneumothorax that I have. So if I feel as if I don't have a good sort of um, space to throw in the dilator or pass the, uh, the finder needle, then either I'll get my colleagues in IR to do it under a fluoroscopy or a CT scan. Or that's when we'll talk about placing a second tube in the OR, surgical, like a surgical chest tube with dissection. So in general, in general, your practice is, is sort of, I guess, what's consistent with anyone who manages pleural disease now where bigger is not better, right? So we're 
shifting to small board chest tube. So we have shifted for a long time now. And and it's rare that we place large board tubes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, and I'm not saying that it's wrong to place a large board chest tube. You just sort of want to consider what, what you'll have to deal with later on. More pain, more narcotics, you know, not walking around as much. Um, I also don't, I also don't know that it necessarily drains again with fluid. I don't know that it necessarily drains any better. And I talk about this with the gutters. Um, you know, nothing makes me happier with an effusion to have than having a well-positioned pigtail or pleurex or indwelling catheter mm -hmm. in the gutter, you know, so that you can sort of get all of that gravity dependent fluid out. Fortunately, I think um, like 90, 95% of the things that we deal with, we can, um, we can manage really well with, with the Seldinger-based uh, pigtail. Uh, just to digress a little bit, uh, one thing that annoys all of us is a chest tube that migrates or comes out. Uh, yeah. What do you do to stitch your tubes in? How do you stitch them in? So um, I leave a, a pretty nice um, Roman sandal. Um, I just, um, you know, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Surgical tubes, I'll place a purse string with, with the Roman sandal. Um, and I also just do a lot of uh, tape. I used to place, um, Foley catheters have these like, um, um, this little tape that you can click in only to the, to the leg. Um, yeah, there's something I mean, called a stat lock or stat fix. Stat or lock, something. exactly yeah. right. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, yeah, I, I haven't used that in a while, um, maybe because I haven't seen them around kind of thing, but I, I should use those more because those are excellent. Those are really excellent. It also takes off tension. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I don't do anything uh, fancy. Uh, what I do do is I tape up every connection very well. Um, and I spend a lot of tape on, on sort of those connections. You, you'd think I'd have stocks in the company with how much tape I put on it because <laughs> the worst thing that I, you know, um, I I'd hate for an, a call in the middle of the night. Hey, uh, you know, one of the connections, um, came apart kind of thing. Thank you so much. Uh, you're on, you know, this is a evidence poor area and, uh, your expert opinion will be greatly valued by our listeners in this topic. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. This was uh, a lot of fun. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks. Yaron. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.